maybe getting started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk, Managing E-Commerce Site Settings. My name is Takia, and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this web conference through Teams Live Events, and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. Today's web conference is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. By participating in this session using Microsoft Teams, your name, email address, phone number and or title may be viewable by other session participants if you do not consent to being part of a recorded session. Please disconnect at this time. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenter or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout and at the end of the event. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Now let's get started. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Brendan Sullivan, Principal PM Lead. Brendan, over to you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to discuss managing e-commerce site settings in Dynamics 365 Commerce. My name is Brendan Sullivan and I am the Principal Product Manager for Dynamics 365 Commerce and I focus on the digital commerce capabilities within our solution. Let's go ahead and look at the places where we can set e-commerce site settings. Um, so all e-commerce sites derive their capabilities from uh, the online channel, um, which is configured in Commerce HQ. So it's an important place to look at site settings. Uh, from there, we have our tenant settings in the site builder, um, which allow us to uh, create or modify settings um, that impact the entire tenant uh, and all the sites within that tenant. And then we have individual site settings at the site level uh, to be able to fine tune those for the individual sites. So let's look at the types of settings we can set and where we can configure them. So starting out on the left hand side, looking at uh, commerce headquarters and being able to modify the channel config, um, you know, being able to configure the overall channel, being able to define currencies, email template profiles, uh, payment methods, um, being able to associate products, um, associating uh, catalogs and assortments that can be reused across channels, and being able to define languages so that you can enable multilingual websites with localized marketing, along with the ability to also do merchandising um, that's localized. So being able to localize your content and marketize your content. From that, we have our tenant and our tenant configurations, um, which really allow you to make changes at a tenant level that cascade down to individual sites, um, as well as a few uh, unique settings throughout uh, the tenant that are tenant specific. Um, so uh, it gives you the ability to define security roles and associate AAD security groups, uh, which have the rights uh, to control and configure uh, the tenant and the sites. We have our ability to uh, manage employee GDPR data. So this gives you the ability to uh, replace an, uh, an employee's uh, alias um, in version data in the CMS should they make a request to do so. Uh, managing your robots.txt file, uh, managing new features so they don't impact your business until you're ready for them and managing uh, customer security through the uh, implementation or uh, assignment of AAD B2C instances um, that you can use for customer accounts, and then you can associate those with sites. Uh, also in the site builder, you can configure individual sites. So this gives you the, <coughs> excuse me, the ability to uh, have multiple sites within a, a tenant to be able to uh, really drive your business how you see fit and being able to interact with customers across a range of websites and to be able to have individual configurations for those sites. You have the ability to manage the sitemap for the individual site um, and to enable the automated uh, sitemap generation capability. 
the ability to define security roles um, that will work within the, the site at the site level, the ability to manage channels and configure uh, one or more channels to work with the site. You have the ability to manage features at the site level. So even though you may have turned them on at the tenant level, you can turn them off at the site level. Uh, this gives you the ability to maybe roll out a feature or test a feature or allow one team to use a feature and another team chooses not to. Uh, managing design overrides, you can control the appearance and layout of websites with uh, low-code CSS and the ability to manage uh, extensions so you can define presets, routes, and content security policies. So let's dig in and look at some different places uh, and different settings that we can make in the system. So first off, we'll start with the channel configuration. I know that uh, Sam, who's one of our moderators today, has uh, presented um, a, a whole talk on how to configure the, the channel for your online site. So I'm not going to exhaustively uh, dig into the channel configuration, but I do just want to call out for those that may not have been able to attend the last meeting um, or who are uh, new to the solution. Um, that in a channel you can configure currencies, tax rules, uh, modes of delivery, email template profiles, fulfillment groups, and configure languages. And uh, that last one is important to your websites and um, that it gives you the ability to um, define various languages that customers can view your website in. Um, it gives you uh, a, uh, the ability to associate uh, those languages with a channel and have multiple languages in it. And it gives you the ability to be able to uh, merchandise and marketize and localize content uh, for the customers. Um, a great example um, would be if you want to target the Canadian market and you want to associate ENCA and FRCA with the same uh, channel, you want to serve the same products at the same price points to uh, customers who speak English and speak French. And so this gives you that capability. Um, you can also uh, have multiple channels associated with a site. So you could have one channel which is um, for the Canadian market, which supports ENCA and FRCA. And you can have one for uh, the American market, which serves the uh, ENUS and ESUS uh, languages for, for customers in America. You can associate um, uh, the two channels with that site, you can say serve the same content to them, uh, but you can actually present different prices, different promotions, different discounts. And because you now have the ability to marketize to those two different markets separately, um, you can have different promotions and you can have different marketing content for them. Uh, so you can look at, uh, you know, Thanksgiving is a classic example. Um, it's on different days in uh, Canada and in America. Um, so you can target a Thanksgiving uh, sale to one market while the other one sees just a normal day's business in the website. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility there. So if we wanted to actually look at what that looks like, well, I can jump over to uh, our, our dashboard. So this is a quick dashboard I threw together for Contoso, which is my demo environment. Shows me, among other things, my channels. So I have my call centers, my store channels, and my online stores. Uh, we're going to drop into online stores and you'll see that I have several here. The commerce solution allows you to have multiple channels um, to be able to, to manage your, your business so you're not limited to just a single channel. And we can go into the Fabricam Extended Online Store and we can look at that channel configuration. So here we've set up our currency, we've set up our tax rules, we've set up our email notification profile, We've defined our payment connectors. Here we're using our native Audion payment connector that comes out of the box. Um, soon we'll have a new PayPal connector that you can implement that will give you PayPal capabilities. And you can always either purchase a connector through our app marketplace or develop a connector using our SDKs uh, to be able to create additional payment, method, payment uh, solutions. Uh, those payment solutions can then be uh, associated here. So you can have multiple payment connectors to be able to power multiple different payment methods. 
And at the bottom, we have our languages, and you can see that I've actually put a number of languages in. Um, so uh, we have, uh, you know, our English uh, US, uh, which is our default language, because that's what I'm going to write my content in. Uh, but I then have the ability to localize into Spanish, French, um, or uh, Queen's English in Australia and the United Kingdom. So it gives me the ability to define a default. The default is what your uh, website will render to if no preset language is defined within the, the URL. And it also uh, signifies the source language that will be used in the XLIF outputs when you export content uh, for localization. So with a, and it's very easy to add a new language. All you have to do is click on add, uh, select the language that you would like to add, uh, and then from the drop down or the drop up in this case, uh, and then uh, it provides a name and you can specify whether or not you want it to be the default. Uh, and then all you need to do is hit save and it'll save it. And when the 1070 job runs uh, in the background, it'll push those changes through and you'll be able to see those in the site builder. So going back to our presentation, um, channel configuration is something that I think most of you already have a very good um, understanding of. Um, channels have been a concept that um, have been in commerce since uh, the retail days. Uh, there's a lot of good documentation out there for the channel configuration, um, as well as the online channel configuration. So um, here are some links that are available that when we present the, uh, the presentation to you, you'll be able to link to those if you don't have access to them already. They're in our document library, um, which has a lot of great information on our product. And then, of course, you'll also be able to reference uh, Sam's uh, presentation on online channel configuration, and hopefully he'll paste a link into the, uh, the chat when he gets a chance. So we'll go ahead and look at the tenant configurations now, uh, dig more into the site builder. Uh, so we can go in and uh, start with what are the types of things that we can configure in a tenant. Um, so at a tenant level, um, we have the ability to set uh, a range of settings that cascade down to our sites, and we can define our core security roles for the tenant. Um, we can manage the employee GDPR data. Uh, we can manage our robots.txt file. Uh, we can manage the, uh, the enablement or disablement of new features, and we can manage our uh, customer security through our AAD entitlements. So we'll go ahead and uh, start digging into these. Um, when it comes to defining security roles, we use predefined AAD security groups. So you create a security group in your uh, AAD front end. Uh, that gives you the ability to then associate those security groups with roles. And we currently have three roles available in uh, the solution today for e-commerce. We have an administrator. And the administrator has the ability to set tenant and site settings. They also have the ability to create new sites and manage and moderate ratings and reviews. I found this on the web. And not helping Siri. Uh, we also have uh, a, a reader role, which has the ability to review but not set tenant and site settings and have access to but not the ability to modify site contents or ratings and reviews. And lastly, we have a specific role for ratings and review moderator, which has the ability to access and utilize the ratings and reviews tools um, for all sites in the tenant. Uh, ratings and reviews, if you have the rating review uh, uh, add-on module, um, gives you the ability to manage all of your ratings and reviews, but it's at the, site, uh, the tenant level and works for all sites within the moderation tool. So if we jump back to our I remember which it's in. Uh, if we come to our next tab, um, this is our site builder application for those who haven't seen it before. Um, this is the default tenant view. So it shows us all of the sites available in the tenant and also gives us access to not only the sites, but our review tools and our tenant settings. So let's go ahead and click into staff and we'll be able to see the staff configurations. You can see that I've associated uh, my commerce PMs with uh, the uh, with the three roles that I have there, but they could certainly be different uh, user groups. 
Uh, and to change these, all we have to do, or to add to them, I should say, because you can have more than one security group associated, we can go ahead and click on manage. Uh, we can go ahead and type in a new security group. So maybe I just want my uh, my directs um, uh, to have access. Uh, that one's not in this uh, security group, um, but it gives me the ability to associate a new uh, a new security group, and I hit add. Um, you'll see that it does um, auto authenticate uh, immediately, so it knows whether it's a valid security group with your AAD. Um, once it's valid and you hit add, it'll add it in. Uh, and you can also remove, um, so you could remove an item by clicking on the trash can. You will get prompted to uh, specify whether or not you want to complete that deletion, um, and you'll be able to do that. Um, as with most items in the uh, site builder for uh, both tenant and site settings, uh, there is a sneaky little save and publish button up here. You do need to uh, select that, whatever it's present, um, to be able to actually affect your changes and store them in the system. So uh, if I did uh, change my administrator roles and add a new group in or delete a group, um, I would want to hit save and publish to affect those changes. If you try to navigate anywhere else in the site builder without doing that, you will get a notification um, reminding you that you made a change and asking you to confirm if you would like to make that change or if you would like to leave. So if you ever make a bunch of settings and you kind of mess it up and you want to leave, feel free to leave. You'll get notified. Um, just say discard and those changes will be left, um, but they won't take place until you hit save and publish. So that's an important uh, step there um, that you may miss the first time you do it. So I want to call it out. Let's go back to our next section, which is uh, managing employee GDPR data. Um, this is important. Um, employees now have the right um, in a number of countries to be able to request that they be forgotten by their employer. It uh, gives you, in our system, all assets that are stored and managed in the content management system um, are versioned. Um, so there can be n number of versions of a document available in the system. And they are stamped not only with date and time of the version, but the person who made the change. Um, this gives you the ability to go back through the history and uh, see who made the changes, when and why, if they made a comment, um, so you, that you have full version tracking. Should a customer or should an employee come to you and want to be forgotten and they make a formal request, um, you can replace their email address with a uh, randomly defined GUID. So this gives you the ability to uh, remove their instance without removing the version. Um, so we can actually see that in process today. We can actually uh, jump over to uh, we can jump over to our uh, uh, site builder. We can go to track content changes. Um, and all we need to do is click on manage, um, drop someone's email address in here. Um, so I'm just going to put in Bob Thomas uh, at Microsoft. Actually, it's validating it, so there isn't a Bob Thomas. I've already used the two people I know, so I'm going to put in uh, uh, so Sam is uh, a member of the team, and we're about to uh, remove any trace of him on this particular website, so we'll just hit replace. Uh, and then all we need to do is close it out and save and it's gonna make those changes. Um, it's quite fast because Sam hasn't been, this is my environment, so Sam hasn't been on it much. Um, so it doesn't have much to change there. Um, the time it takes to run will vary. Um, it'll vary by um, how many uh, uh, changes that, that person has made within the site. Uh, on average, it takes no more than two to three minutes, and that's someone who has you know, extensive uh, years worth of changes in the system. Uh, so very easy to, uh, very easy to control and uh, make those changes if you need to. We'll come back to uh, PowerPoint and we'll look at our robots.txt. Uh, this gives you the ability to provide domain level servicing of the robots.txt uh, file um, that supports all sites within the tenant. Um, you can create and upload a custom robots.txt file or you can replace the existing one with a new version. So if you want to make uh, 
if you want to download a version of it, make a few changes and upload the new version, you can do that, um, or you can upload an entirely new version. Um, we can actually see that in progress here, so we can actually go and look at our robots.txt. You'll see that I already have one in place. Um, if there isn't one available, then it'll be blank. Um, we can come in and we can actually see that version and we can actually do a replacement on it by hitting the upload button, selecting the new robots.txt, and then uh, hitting open and it'll automatically upload it. Um, and once it's uploaded, uh, it will automatically take effect. Um, so unlike the others where you have a save button here, um, it will automatically take effect and uh, be published in the system. We can go back to our tenant configuration um, and this gives, a, uh, we can look at managing new features. So as we roll out new features in commerce that affect uh, the site builder application and the way that your sites operate, um, we're conscious that we don't want to negatively impact someone's business and that we want to uh, give you the ability to enable new features. Um, if you have 30 sites and we have some customers who have 20 or 30 sites, um, you may want to turn this on once so that you have it across all of your sites and you can do that at the tenant level. Um, but we do show you and we'll show you in a minute that you can change that at a site level if you want to restrict it um, from certain sites. This also gives you the ability to preview and flight features. Um, so you can turn them on just in a, a dev or test environment. Uh, you can also choose to turn them on maybe for just one production site and see how it works in that site before you turn it on uh, for other sites in your tenant. Um, it does prevent uh, new releases from impacting your productivity and your business. And some examples of new features would be publish groups, accessibility validation using the integrated uh, accessibility insights from Microsoft, um, our experimentation using our native connector with Optimizely, and your localization and encoding. And it's really easy to go and uh, turn features on and off. So we can simply click on features. You can see that uh, there are certain features here that are enabled and there are certain features that are off. Uh, so we can go ahead and we can turn on URL localization and encoding. Um, they're not on yet, um, but if I hit the old save publish button, um, now those uh, settings are set and they'll be available uh, to use in the other sites. And I can go and turn them on or off in those sites. As we release new features, we'll add them in here and there will be a call out in our release notes uh, when a feature needs to be turned on to be able to use it. So you won't have to come back here periodically and just check. Um, as you're reading through our release notes, you'll be able to understand if you need to come here and make this change. So we can now go and look at our AD B2C configuration. Uh, this is the last thing you can do in the tenant. Uh, this gives you the ability to configure AD B2C instances, which are used for customer accounts, and gives you the ability to uh, configure them for use across the websites. Uh, there are two different ways you can look at using AD B2C, and we've optimized for both options, so it's really how you want to run your business. But in one instance, you can use one AD B2C instance across all of your websites. So if you have a common set of websites and you want to use the same customer logins, um, you can do that. So maybe you have a, a wholesale site, maybe you have a, a, a high-end luxury site and you have kind of your mainstream brand site and you wanna use the same login across all three of those, you can do that with one AD B2C instance. There are also customers of ours who want to have an individual AD B2C instance per site. A great example of this would be Chateau St. Michel Wineries. Uh, they actually have uh, over 20 brands that they support. Um, each of those brands has its own unique brand identity and to enforce that brand identity, they want each one of those to have their own unique login. Uh, so this gives you the ability to actually manage as many different AAD B2C instances as you want and to associate each individual one with a site. Um, so it gives you a lot of flexibility to be able to manage your AAD B2C. The configuration of the AD B2C instance is quite easy. Um, we can come in here and we can click on B2C settings. 
And once we're on B2C settings, um, we can actually click on our B2C applications and we can see the applications that are installed. And to include a new one, we can simply click add and fill in the information that's provided to us by the AD B2C administrator. Um, populate that information in here. Uh, it will validate, uh, click OK. And when you hit OK and hit save, it'll automatically save those changes into the system and you can now use those in our site settings. And we'll actually see where we apply those here in a minute. So that's a brief tour of the tenant settings, always available in the home screen uh, of your site builder, um, where you can see your sites, uh, your reviews, and your tenant settings all in one place. So we'll jump into sites, and you'll see that we have a list of them here. So I'm gonna go into our Fabricam demo site, and you'll see that site settings is at the bottom. It's always at the bottom of your property panel. Um, it's a little gear if it's closed, but if you open it up, you'll see your site settings there. And we can jump into the site settings and see the things that we can do in at the site level versus the tenant level. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. And in the site configuration, um, there are a number of things that we can do. There are a number of general settings that we can set, um, which allow us to do things like turn on GOIP lookup and turn on sitemap generation. We can define security roles. Uh, we can manage channels and features. Um, we can manage design overrides and upload CSS uh, scripts to, to make layout and uh, appearance changes. And we can manage extensions. So let's dig into each of these a little more. To start with, let's look at some of those uh, general configuration settings that we have. And this is kind of a place where we're just going to be adding new uh, new feature switches and new, uh, I, I guess, capability switches um, that are things that you may want to turn on uh, for your site. And you may want to differ between sites. Um, so you may well have a site that you want to enable um, uh, GOIP lookup and you might have another one where you don't. So this gives you the ability to control it at that level. So things you can do are location-based store detection through GOIP, enable automatic sitemaps through our sitemap generation service, and manage uh, uh, URL redirects in bulk. So let's go ahead and look at the uh, location-based store detection. Uh, this gives you the ability to do uh, market-based lookup. Um, we do this using the Bing Maps API. And it gives you the ability to turn this on and once turned on exposes it through our SDK uh, so that you can create custom modules that are market aware. Um, so you can build a market selector um, or you can build uh, something that automatically selects the market and presents it in the UX. Um, we are looking at providing a market selection module in the coming months so that it will appear in our module library and something you won't have to customize. And we're also looking at providing additional GOIP features um, like providing finer grained resolution, uh, zip and postcode resolution and support for third party services. Um, so if you wanna use a third party service other than uh, Bing Maps API, you can do that. Uh, it's really easy to set these settings, works a lot like the uh, feature switches. Um, so we can jump over there in just a second, but I will just talk about the automatic sitemaps first. Um, so the auto automatic sitemaps are um, uh, once enabled um, by clicking the on switch, they automatically light up and give you the ability to uh, automatically generate the sitemaps without you having to take any additional action. Um, it generates um, entries for marketing pages, product description pages, and category landing pages. And it gives you the ability to uh, uh, add those in as soon as those uh, product display pages and category landing pages are uh, created and assorted and uh, run through the associated P jobs, or as soon as a marketing page is published. When a marketing page is published, it's automatically written to your uh, sitemap. And our SLA for PDP and CLP pages is within 10 minutes of it being, of the P job having been run successfully. So as soon as you light something up and it's available in Site Builder, within 10 minutes, it'll be in your sitemap and ready for uh, search engines to index and uh, uh, be able to read. 
When you enable the sitemap, it also gives you the um, two additional panels that'll light up, which show you the sitemap additional data and the sitemap URLs. Uh, this lets you see the last time that a sitemap was created, um, shows you the last time it was generated, the last time the update uh, sync job ran successfully, and the last time an update was actually made to the file. Um, as you can see, I don't change my uh, my sitemap content very often, but it uh, it does run at a fairly regular clip. It also provides you with the URLs, so you don't have to go and try to figure them out yourselves. Um, you can copy the URLs out, and you can use these if you want to uh, uh, send them to a, a, a search engine or if you want to use them in any SEO management tool. So we can jump out and actually look at the uh, sitemap real quick. Uh, so we can actually go in our site settings. We're going to click on general and you can see that we've enabled location based store detection. So I've turned that on. Um, I've enabled my sitemap by turning it on and you can see my latest information here. Um, you can see that I did make um, a content change earlier today for a demo. Um, so that's actually been uh, updated and you can see that it's actually updated my sitemap um, as well. And of course, we have our sitemap URL if I want to be able to access it or use it in a third party tool. Again, with any of those changes, you want to hit save and publish to actually get that update to take effect. Let's go back and the next thing we want to look at is our bulk URL redirect mapping. Um, we had a lot of feedback from our customers that URL management um, is great if you want to uh, manage an individual URL in Site Builder. Uh, but oftentimes when you want to do things in bulk, if you have to, um, tens of thousands of products and if you want to make large wholesale changes, um, it can be time consuming to go and do it one by one. Uh, so we've built this tool that gives you the ability to do this through a CSV file. Um, so you can create a very simple CSV file, which just has four, um, four uh, items in it that you need to provide. Uh, and you can upload that file and uh, when you save and publish that file, it'll automatically take um, effect and it'll update your sitemap and it'll update um, uh, all the information needed to be able to affect those redirects. Uh, you can also download a new version of the redirect map and you can upload a newer version so you can always keep modifying it um, and you can keep replacing it um, once you have a new one up there. The CSV file is really quite straightforward. Um, it's your source URL, which is the URL that you want to change. It's the target URL, which is the uh, new uh, page that you want the URL to point to. It allows you to set uh, the type of redirects. You can set either a permanent or temporary redirect, and you can specify whether or not the URL should be treated with case sensitivity. Um, this last uh, item is optional. If it's set to true, then it will, of course, um, treat it with sensitivity. Um, if it's uh, set to false or if it's omitted, then it will be assumed to be false and it will uh, uh, not use case sensitivity. So uh, a customer can enter any the URL in uppercase or lowercase and it'll be uh, treated the same. Let's actually take a look at that real quick. Um, so I can actually jump out to uh, Chrome. We can take a look at it here. Um, we can see that uh, we've turned it on. Um, we have a version of the file out there, so I'm just going to go and look that guy up real quick. And we can actually see our, uh, our redirects. Uh, so we can open it up here, and you can see that it's a very simple file to configure. Um, so I've uh, put all my values in there and I've uploaded it. I could add a new value. Um, so I could add a new value. And we'll save that change and we will replace it. So it's very easy to replace. Um, we'll just select redirects and open. Uh, it'll uh, take that file up and we'll say save and publish and it's now updated that uh, URL. So very easy to come in and make bulk redirects. Um, you can uh, specify as many URLs as you want. Um, I don't have an SLA for how long it takes, but it does process it um, as soon as you upload it. 
Um, so it should be fairly uh, performant in running through all those uh, changes for you. Go back to our presentation. And we want to look at security roles. Security roles work the exact same way um, in terms of uh, uh, AED security group uh, usage and assignment um, as they do in the tenant. Um, we just have uh, the roles are slightly different. Um, uh, the administrator role um, retains the same name, but it gives you the ability within the site to uh, configure the site settings as well as the ability to create and uh, manage, edit, manage, publish, and delete the web content. Uh, it also has a web producer role. Um, the web producer role has the ability to create, edit, manage, publish, and delete web content, but does not have the ability to set site configurations. And then there's a reader role. So if you have uh, a management chain, um, or if you have, uh, if you're working with uh, departments that need to have uh, review rights of the content and want to be able to come in and review the content without being able to modify it, um, you can extend them reader privileges and they'll be able to uh, review uh, preview pages um, as well as look at content within the site builder tool itself. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to, to send, show you the individual, um, how to configure the the roles at the site level because it works the exact same way as the tenant level. Um, so just click on the manage button, type in the AED security group, hit add and hit save and publish, and you'll be on your way. We can then look at the channel management. Uh, so channel management allows you to add an online retail channel that maps to the website. Uh, you can have more than one channel mapped to a site, which give you the ability to enable multi-channel site configurations. Um, a great example of this would be one of our customers, uh, Cheetah Design in New Zealand. They actually operate uh, in uh, New Zealand and Australia. They want to use the same site with the same English content, um, but they actually want to have two separate channels that have two separate um, assortments of products, prices, um, and other types of information associated with them. So this gives them the ability to do that. Um, so it's very easy to set up either a single channel um, for a site or a multiple channel site. Um, you can also configure your languages for your channel um, so that you can present localized marketing product and category content to your customers, and you can also present the marketized content that we talked about earlier. So we can actually look at what that looks like in the Site Builder application. Uh, so we can come in and we can look at our channels. You can see the channels that I have associated with my demo site. Um, I currently have uh, just one, my Fabricam channel, which we looked at before, and you'll see that I have some of those languages associated with it. Uh, I can come in and I can click on the channel and I can add locales. Um, I don't think it's synced yet because I haven't run the p-job. Uh, so I can't add those additionals that I showed you earlier, but I can configure the ones that I have. Um, I can also come in and I can control a, uh, I can see what it actually looks like. You can see I don't have any content for it yet, um, but I can come in and I can select the uh, Spanish version. And when adding a, uh, a locale um, for a particular language, uh, I have uh, the ability to set the domain that I want it to match to, and I have the ability to uh, set a match path. Uh, match path is just the uh, substring in the URL that you want to represent your language. Um, so I could put in ES, I could put in ESMX, um, I could put in MX, I could put in Mexico. Um, it's really up to you what you want to use, um, but you can specify anything there that you want. So I can actually go ahead and uh, save that guy. And you'll see that it now changes my domain to Mexico. So now anyone who comes in and types in uh, fabricam.com slash Mexico will see the Spanish content uh, versus the English content. So it makes it very easy for you to come in and change those and configure those. Um, there are also different, uh, there are different tribes within uh, SEO. Um, that feel you get a different uplift versus uh, using the full Lang locale versus using just the Lang. Um, so this gives you the ability to uh, tinker with it and cater for what you think is best for your business. Also within the uh, 
the channel configuration, you can set your AAD B2C instance so that you can uh, configure it to work with uh, a particular channel. You can also add a channel, um, very similar to just adding a locale, but giving you the ability to select the channel that you want to add, um, and then being able to select the default locale that you want to represent your site, and selecting the uh, the uh, domain that you want to associate with it, and if you want to associate any pathing with the default locale. Um, and you just hit OK, and with everything, uh, you hit Save and Publish, and it'll automatically um, go live for you. So very easy to control and modify your channels. Um, there's a lot more coming on the channel configuration here, as well as how to use uh, the localization in the system uh, in the coming weeks. Um, and Stuart Hargris from my team will be uh, presenting that solution to you um, in a, a full dedicated session so you can uh, walk through uh, how to use the localization once it's out there. We can go back to our presentation and we can look at managing new features. Um, very similar to the way that we manage new features at the uh, tenant level, except you can now control them at the site level. Um, so as I mentioned before, this gives you the ability to control the site settings um, differently. Um, so if you have multiple sites and maybe you want to flight a feature, um, maybe you have different teams working on different websites and one would like to use the feature and the other wouldn't, um, you can you can uh, help them uh, support and modify that. And for the team that wants it, you can make it available to them. For the team that doesn't, you can keep the clutter um, down to a minimum. So it gives you the ability to uh, control those settings. Uh, we can actually take a look at that very quickly in our site and we can look at our features. Here's the dialog. I didn't actually save my changes. Um, now I uh, uh, don't want to save those changes. so I'm just going to hit OK and we'll bounce on out of that. Uh, so again, you can see that I can set those items. You'll see because I turned on uh, URL localization encoding at the tenant level that it's automatically added it to my site. Uh, but let's say for this particular site, I want those turned off. Uh, so I can turn them off and I can hit save and publish and those are now turned off from my website. Um, another one, another feature that's uh, specific to a site, not to a tenant is cross channel. Um, so if I wanna be able to reuse content across channels, um, I can turn that on here and it'll give me that ability to do so. Don't actually have everything configured to support that. So um, it's not gonna allow me to turn it on because I only have one channel on the site. Um, but it's a capability that we have in the system that's unique to the site and not present to the tenant. We can look at our design overrides, and this is what gives you the ability to control layout and appearance of your site through CSS overrides. Um, it gives you the ability to uh, upload multiple override files, though only one could be active at any time. Um, it does give you the ability to preview uh, those CSS overrides in a particular file um, in situ within uh, your site. It allows you to do that for both uh, published content and content that may be in a draft state in your uh, system. So let's actually take a look at that. Um, first of all, we can go to our site and we can go to design and you'll see that I actually have a, a CSS override file available already. Um, it's not active, it's in a deactivated state, and I don't currently have any in an active state, um, but it is available for me to use. Um, we can actually take a look at our file. Um, we can actually come and look at our CSS. And you can see that um, I've modified what my cookie uh, button looks like. I've modified what my content uh, block looks like. Um, I've modified what my promo banner looks like. I've made it an ugly color and I've done the same for uh, uh, the background color for one of my content block types. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to close that. And I'm going to open up a new tab. And very quickly, we will look at our demo site. And this is a demo site. As you'll recall, the, the CSS override hasn't been applied yet. So you'll see that I have a green button, I have a green button, I have a black border, um, and I have a particular font for my, uh, my carousel slide title. So we can now come in and uh, we can go and we can turn on, we can just turn it on and 
Uh, as with everything in IT, we'll hope and pray that it works the way we wanted it to. Um, and But it will be seen immediately by customers. Or we can preview it. So let's actually preview what this would look like. Um, so again, I can choose a published page or I can choose a draft state of a page. What's the difference? Um, if you'll, I believe you've had a, uh, a presentation on how the CMS works, um, but all the content is stored, but it's not actually available to a customer until it's published. So if you want to see what your customers are going to see today, you can click on home page in the published version. If you want to see a draft version of that page, if you want to see something that you've been working on today but isn't published out to customers, you can click on draft and you can select it. So it'll allow you to see the version of the page that you want to see uh, the CSS reflected in. Uh, let's go ahead and look at the published version of the page. Um, we'll look at the home page. You can always search for another one here if you want. Um, and we'll go ahead and we'll get our URLs. Uh, because we have multiple languages associated with the site, we have the ability to see the content in relation, the CSS uh, changes in relation to each of those sites. So if you do have marketing content in uh, ESMX or in FR, it'll allow you to see what that looks like. Let's go ahead and click on ENUS, and this will open up the preview with the CSS override uh, in situ. Uh, all of our previews are uh, authenticated, um, so you can't just share this with anybody. So it takes a little bit longer for it to generate. Um, but once it does, you can see that we now got those CSS overrides in place. And so we have, uh, we now have a black accept button. We now have a really ugly uh, red color for our banner and a new font style and a new ugly color for our button uh, upstate. Uh, so maybe I don't like these, maybe I'll close that and dismiss this and I won't activate it, but then uh, uh, Stuart and Sam say, no, 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 this is what we want. Let's go ahead and activate it. So, you know, we'll go ahead and activate it. Um, it's now active. Um, that's all it takes to activate it. You'll see that it's moved up to the active CSS override. Um, I do have the ability to come in and deactivate it and it's now available on our website. So let's go back a tab to our public website um, where we have the old version showing here. And if we hit refresh, uh, we now get the new version of the CSS affecting all customers who come to the Fabricam site. Um, we can, of course, always go back and deactivate. Um, it'll take a couple of seconds, um, but it usually doesn't take more than, than a few seconds um, for it to affect, and we can come back and we can request a new version and you see it only takes about uh, 10 or 15 seconds to actually um, invalidate in production so customers are, are back to seeing um, the nice uh, black and green so very easy to manage css overrides again you can have as many css overrides as you like um, and you can choose which one you want to be active but you can only have one active at any time uh, this is also really, really handy for uh, date and time events. Um, so if you want a particular CSS override for Black Friday or for Boxing Day, um, if you want one for a spring refresh or a fall refresh um, tied to a marketing event and they're going to be short lived, you can upload the CSS, um, have it there, preview it, know that it works, uh, enable it. And once uh, that promotion or time period has run its course, revert back to your standard uh, theme without having to make any other changes. So very convenient. Can actually uh, come in here and we can look at uh, extensions. This is the last area we want to look at, but there are three different areas within the extensions uh, that we can uh, uh, review today. Um, extensions are really uh, points where you can uh, drive uh, additional extensibility within your website uh, and again can be different by website so that you can configure them separately to meet the needs of your customers and you can set some site experience capabilities some routing capabilities and some content security policies so let's look at our uh, our site experience capabilities we can do things like configure our major theme um, so if you have a, a fully developed uh, set of themes uh, that have been deployed to your site, you can actually toggle between those and choose which one you want to be uh, present. 
Um, this gives you the ability to have multiple themes stored in the system and to choose which one you want to use at a given point in time. Allows you to define the DNS uh, uh, prefetch URLs. Um, gives you the ability to uh, enable or disable server-side error checking. Um, gives you the ability to set the cart expiration time. A blank time means that your cart will expire as soon as you leave the cart or, or leave the site. Um, but you can also choose to uh, keep items persistent um, for a period of time if you want to set a time period there. Um, gives you the ability to set your image quality settings. You can actually say that all images will be served at a particular uh, quality settings. You can say 80% for uh, your images. And then you, of course, will have the ability at, um, at uh, page authoring time to be able to configure uh, the image settings. So if you want to put a higher quality on a mosaic um, that's on the, uh, the top of the page before the fold, um, you can do that. Um, so it gives you that uh, finer grained quality, but allows you here to set kind of a global property um, that uh, you can use to ensure a uh, performant load time across your pages. Also have the uh, order quantity limits, um, being able to set constraints within ratings and reviews, uh, being able to set prefixes and suffixes for titles. Um, so you can pre-append uh, those to either the front or the end. Um, being able to set uh, items like the search parameter constraints, um, define gift card types, and a whole range of other items that you can do um, within the extensions. And so we can look at those real quick. Um, so we can actually come into extensions and we can look at our configuration. You can see that I have uh, several themes here, so I could actually choose a theme um, and assign it. Um, my prefetch URLs, my excluded domains, um, a number of settings to be able to do things like disable my cookie compliance if I wanted to, um, set those cart expiration uh, times, uh, configure my image quality, uh, being able to do things like set my data action depth, uh, my prefixes and suffixes, uh, ratings and reviews, how I want them displayed, um, being able to set my GeoIP endpoint, um, being able to disable uh, certain things, being able to disable buy online pickup in store, uh, setting my search query parameters, um, setting the inventory management capabilities. Um, so kind of a grab bag of items here um, that affect how the customer will be able to, to use your site. Next, we want to look at the routing. And so the routing gives you the ability to uh, control uh, pages where actions are associated. So things like account pages, um, define your cart and checkout pages, your home point page um, as your default, your loyalty pages, um, the ability to order, um, set your order confirmation pages. Um, if you want things like a ratings and review policies page, you can set that. Um, set your search pages and your whist list pages. Um, so very easy to come in and do that. Um, we just go to our uh, routes, um, select the route that we want to set, um, maybe uh, for my order details page or for my loyalty signup page, I have uh, I have a new page that I want to use. Uh, click on it, it gives us the uh, our link selector. Um, we can select the page that we want to associate with it and hit OK, and it will now change that out. So very easy to come in and change uh, the routes. You can add routes and you can also remove items. So if you want to remove it, just hit the trash can. As always, hit save and publish if you actually want to affect the change. And lastly, we just want to look at content security policies. Um, this gives you the ability to configure specific content security policies at the site level. Uh, it allows you to enable communication with external sites and services. Um, it helps to combat inline script attacks, um, gives you the ability to set uh, your policies, uh, gives you the ability to support content from external CMS services, um, support external fonts and external CSS files. Uh, again, very easy to, uh, to configure. Uh, so we can come in and we can click on content security policy, and here you can start to set those settings. You can um, uh, disable content security policy. Um, you can enable the nouns. Uh, you can uh, set up your uh, your sources. You can 
Uh, here we've configured our Audien test account because it's actually um, a third party payment provider that we need to be able to connect and communicate to from our website. Um, we have our uh, uh, some external content sources, um, the ability to set your your font, um, being able to set your image source, whether it be um, our solution or another, um, and being able to set up scripts. So here we not only have our um, uh, our audience payment connector, but we can enter in um, a uh, if we wanted to use Google Analytics, um, we could configure that here. If we wanted to put um, uh, Microsoft Clarity for heat map use, we could add that in here um, so that you can work with those third parties. Um, so very easy to come in and configure those items here. And as always, hit save and publish. And that really concludes the three places where you can set uh, configurations in the system. Uh, whether it's at the uh, online channel in Commerce HQ, it's in the uh, site builder tenant or the site builder uh, site, um, and being able to set all those configurations to be able to power your business. Um, we have about four minutes left, so are there any questions um, from the audience? Sounds like we don't have any questions, so I will go ahead and close. Um, I'll close by thanking you all uh, for taking uh, the time to review this content. And as always, if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself or my team and we'll be happy to help you. Uh, and I'll turn it uh, back over to Takia to close us out. Thank you, Brendan. We would like to get your feedback on today's session. I have posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We value your feedback and welcome your input on how we did today and what you would like to see in future sessions. Their survey scores are on a scale from one to five with five being the highest score possible. Thank you for your participation. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenter, Brendan, and a thank you to our audience for logging in and joining us today. Please stay safe and have a great rest of your day or evening wherever you are. Goodbye.